this thing going! recent being Chicago. It's different, isn't it? It's definitely different. Uh, more sun, uh, fewer police cars. Uh, that's my observation so far. Uh, and so for the people like Pam who don't know what the Sunday Assembly is, I will uh, explain. Uh, the Sunday Assembly is a godless congregation that celebrates life! 
there's that simple thing that we come from nothing, we go to nothing, and then for 70, 80, maybe even 100 years, if you do nothing fun at all, uh, <laughs> then you get, to, you get to be alive. And uh, we've got an awesome motto. Uh, the, our motto is live better, help often, and wonder more. Uh, and, uh, and our mission is, uh, our mission is to help everyone live this one life as fully as possible. Uh, this is not a place where, you know, we don't set out to tell people how to live or what to do, but generally, whatever people are trying to do in life, we want this to be a place that helps them do it as well as they can. And, uh, it's, and admittedly, it's, it's got a bit of, uh, attention, it's been called the Atheist Church. Uh, Though we prefer to think of it as all the best bits of church, but with zero religion and awesome pop songs. <laughs> yeah, and uh, look, I'm sure you can imagine that if you do get labelled the atheist church, uh, you will get a lot of abuse online. We've discovered that, particularly on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is this amazing invention which takes so many wonderful 21st century technologies to create a web platform which is chiefly used to tell people you don't know that they suck. Uh, and because we, because we were labelled the Atheist Church, we, be, we became a massive target for those evangelical, militant, intolerant, fundamentalist atheists. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because then we obviously we started it, and within a few days we suddenly had loads of people telling us that the way we don't believe in God is not the right way to not believe in God. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, apparently if you do it, what you should be doing is because this is not we, this is not a place to bash religion. We think we've got as men as you know cool enough stuff to talk about. You know, just the, just on our own, you know? So uh, that's what we do, and uh, it has been, it's been a hell of a ride. We, uh, we started it in London, in, just in January, because Pippa and I, we were going on a, we were going on a car journey. We're both stand-up comedians, uh, and, is it, is it, sorry, I sorry, thought I heard music playing there. So, <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> sorry? I said we could do that in Dubai. That is pretty ace. Sometimes you do see those, you know, sometimes you see those mega churches and every now and again, the preacher, when he gets serious, they dip the lights and they just drop a minor key. <laughs> I mean, what they're saying I disagree with, but their theatrics are amazing. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, so yeah, so Pippa and I, we were going on a car journey, we are just going on the way to a gig, and it turned out we both wanted to do something which was like church, but for, you know, people who believed in good, but maybe didn't believe in God. And uh, then we, uh, we set about, I mean, we've each taken different paths to coming up with this idea. For me, uh, it was about six years ago, I went to a church service, in, I was at a carol concert with my family, and as I left, I thought, God, there are so many great things about this, which I really do like, it's just a shame that in the middle there's something I disagree with. And I was like, I love singing, I love, you know, thinking about improving myself and helping other people, you know, I love stories, you know, and I love doing it all in community. Uh, it's just a shame that at the middle there's this God thing. And, uh, you know, and so uh, for, so, I, but, I, you know, I think, well, maybe we can do it without that. Because, I mean, think about it. If you had an awesome pair of shoes, you had an awesome pair of shoes, but they had a pebble in it, you know, you wouldn't chuck away the shoes. You know, you just take out the pebble. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I made that analogy to, uh, I was speaking to a bishop. Uh, yeah, I was speaking to, he's a Scot, in fact he's an ex-bishop, he's a lovely guy called Richard Holloway. He used to be in charge of the bishop of the whole church of Scotland, and then he retired for, uh, from being a bishop and went, oh, sorry guys, I think I was kind of an atheist. Uh, and so, uh, but he still did, you know, like, <laughs> he was still a bishop of the church. Uh, and, uh, and so I made that same analogy to him, I was like, you know, if I had a pair of shoes and they had a stone in it, you'd take out the shoes, you'd still, you'd take out the stone and have a pair of shoes. And he went, oh, Sanderson, well done. You've just made your first parable. Uh, and so, but what happened was Pippa and I, we started this in, we started this in London and it was bizarre. We we thought we've just like, we've done comedy nights in the past, and we know if you do a new night, you're just hoping that 30 people turn up. And it was suddenly 200 people 
came through the door. At the next one, in next month there were 300. The month afterwards we had to go to two services a month and now there's about between 400 and 500 people meet uh, twice, uh, twice a month to just do this. And it's really, really amazing. Uh, but we didn't really count, again, on the internet because the moment we started we had people writing into us saying they would like one near them. Uh, where's Neil? Yeah, there's Neil. Neil, when did you write to us to try getting in touch with someone? Yeah, in March. That was it. So we suddenly started getting these letters in from all manner of people. And I said, oh, yeah. We, uh, and Neil, you've, you've done well. I mean, Neil's sitting in a, uh, the event which Debbie <laughs> has really pulled together. You just got a round of applause. <laughs> Take it. Left it up. <laughs> the, uh, and. Uh, and so then we call these, and I certainly, when Neil went on our forums, I did not think that in November this year, I'd be standing in this wonderful hall in a beautiful park at the start of uh, Sunday Assembly San Diego, but it has weirdly happened. Uh, what we've often said in the past is, you know, we don't believe in God, but if we did, we'd definitely think he was on our side. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, what happened is that we've come here to just launch it, you know, just to show, you know, how we do it and a bit of the flavour of what's happening. And afterwards, we're going to leave it in. If anyone would like to do this, just hang around afterwards. We're going to have a night, like, get the team together. It's a bit like, you know, the start of a Dirty Dozen, you know, or Ocean's 12. Where you go and get a, a disparate group of people who, you know, have a bit of friction and you end up doing something awesome, you know, in Las Vegas. <laughs> Actually, it's nothing like Ocean's 12. Uh, and so, uh, we, yeah, we've come over here to do this. There's, uh, uh, by the way, please do stand up if you have uh, helped organising this today. You some very modest people. There we go. Guys, give them a huge round of applause. This is all, this is all done by volunteers. We just turned up here this morning and we fed a burger. Uh, very reasonably sized portion. Uh, and uh, and so we so we're here and uh, we're just going to you know do this first one and afterwards get out of the way. The theme is wonder. So to tell you what else is going to happen uh, afterwards. There is going to be there's going to be a reading. Yeah, there's going to be a talk. Yeah, there's going to be more songs. There's going to be a moment of silence. Don't worry guys, I'm not going to trick you to pray. Uh, no, but it's just a moment of silence because, you know, we've all got smartphones to death nowadays. It's nice it's just to have a moment to reflect and be mindful. Uh, that is always a good way to freak out a room full of humorous yeah, atheists and skeptics. Yeah. Yeah. And then afterwards there is going to be uh, coffee and cake in the end. Does that sound good? together and get very, very excited for the first reading by the wonderful Zoe! Hi, I'm Zoe, and math is one of my favorite subjects. I'm interested in working with zeros because it seems like zeros shouldn't even exist, but they matter a lot. A zero isn't an integer, and it can't be negative or positive. And no matter what, it still has a value, even though it's zero. I like writing numbers in scientific notation because it makes it so much easier to understand what we're working with. If scientists had to work with a number like 28 billion with a lot of zeros, then it'd be difficult. But thanks to scientific notation, 28 billion seems like a much smaller and more manageable number. That is 2 and 8 tenths times 10 to the 13th power. <laughs> Science is another one of my favorite subjects. Last year in fifth grade, we learned a lot more and in much greater detail than this year in sixth grade. In fifth grade, we learned about cells. It was cool to think about what's happening inside your body. Each cell is so complex. So this year, my favorite science lesson was about the electromagnetic spectrum. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays are very interesting. I did a special report on the planet Saturn with its beautiful rings. Now we're studying how wind causes weather. But enough about sixth grade. I would love to share some good words from Carl Sagan. <laughs> he wrote, from this distant vantage point, 
The Earth may not seem of any particular interest, but for us, it's different. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of proud religions, ideologies and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there, on a moat of dust suspended in the sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic area. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors, so that, in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of the dawn. <laughs> Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one of the corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they all to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that hell will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another, and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Happy birthday, Carl Sagan. reading, it's, uh, it's only marred in my case by looking and going, oh, that 11-year-old is way smarter than I am. <laughs> uh, and that's super great. Uh, the, oh, it is wonderful whenever, I mean, we end up, we end up we've been doing this uh, all over, we, all over the UK, and then we went to Ireland, and we've, in the past week we've launched five uh, Sunday assemblies uh, all over the US. On Thursday we were in Nashville which is a surprising place, uh, just full stop, uh, really. And, and somehow, in all the traveling and itineraries and the misconnections and the almost losing my mobile phone and laptop in five minutes, just this morning, uh, it's sometimes easy to, you know, not connect with what we're doing here, which, and it's the same thing, it's easy not to connect in everyday life with the fact that we're alive. And it's when you go and hear a reading like that which somehow connects the very bigness with the very smallness, with the wonder which is all around us so far we can't even imagine it, with the wonder which just comes from us being humans next to other humans. And thank you very much, Zoe, for that excellent reading which was able to help me find that in a day which has had some stressful points as well as delicious points. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, we are now going to go uh, introduce someone else who's going to make me feel quite dumb, uh, because he is the, one of the world's experts on the thing which confuses me most, which is dark matter. Uh, and uh, his name is Dr. Kim Grice. He advises presidents uh, on all manner of things, uh, like astronomy, is that it? Check that out. I mean, you said you advise presidents on anything? Nor do I. <laughs> Dr. Kim Rice does. So ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Kim Rice! Well, welcome. So today, I thought I'd talk a little bit about one of the biggest unsolved mysteries in science. I love science because we just keep getting new mysteries. We figure stuff out and we just say, what's next? So, let's see, this is not going on. 
There we go. Somehow it cuts off. So the wonders of the dark side, dark energy and dark matter, I'll talk about that. But before that, I wanted to say a few words about where all this comes from. Where does all of our science come from? Well, it comes from wondering. And uh, so on Carl Sagan's birthday, it's a good thing to think about wondering. And humans have uh, looked up in the sky for many millennia and wondered what was up there. Uh, they made up stories. They saw what was up in the night sky. You can go do it today. Um, and they just made up stories about what was up there, and then they connected those stories to what, where they came from and where everything came from. And that is the source of astronomy. That's the source of science, is this wondering. Um, we, what I find remarkable is that our generation, we, are the first humans in history that actually have a pretty good idea of what is up there and where the stuff came from. This is a remarkable situation. And we got there by the method of science, by doing this kind of wondering, but then checking and making sure it's right. So how do we know what dark matter is? How do we do know what's up there? Well, if for nearby things, like the solar system, you can just build a spacecraft and go visit it. This is Cassini visiting uh, Saturn. Right? And, or, or go to Mars and check it out. But for things beyond the solar system, it's just too far. You cannot go there. So what do we do? How do we find out what's going on long away? Well, we use telescopes. And we at the University of California are lucky to have access to the Keck telescopes, the biggest in the world. We use those, or we use the Hubble Space Telescope up in space. And if we're looking at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, we need all of it. And she did such a great job. She got the whole thing. We need to look at every single one of those, from radio to x-ray to gamma ray. So we have Chandra X-ray Satellite, which gives us an x-ray view of the universe. So what's the method? The method is almost always the same. We look at something, like you can walk out tonight, my little laser pointer stopped working, just now, yeah, that's all my point, but you can go and see Orion Nebula up in the sky on the left here tonight. Um, what you do is you take your big telescope and you zoom in. You zoom in in the middle there, and then you zoom in more, and you keep zooming in with bigger and bigger telescopes until finally what you see are the things in the corners. Those are little tiny stars with their solar systems being formed. Little tiny, they're the same as the sun. So we can actually see, if you look down the lower left, a solar system being created with a star and planetary system. So we don't have to guess. We don't have to guess how planets and stars are made. We can just look, right? And we can see thousands and thousands of them. We see stars and planets being made. We also see them exploding and dying. This is the Crab Nebula, a supernova explosion. And what we find out from this, by looking at enough of it, we can figure out what's going to happen to ours. And we know that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. It's got about, the Sun's got about five more billion years to go. Then it's going to grow to a red giant and burn us to a crisp. That's what's going to happen. Well, how do we know that? We can see it happening out in space. So what else do we see out there? Well, if you look out, the main thing you see in space are these kind of nebula, these kind of groups of stars, which we call galaxies. What are these things? They didn't know. A hundred years ago, they didn't know what these were. But by getting bigger telescopes and zooming in, you can actually resolve them into stars. And you can see that a galaxy like this is actually a hundred billion stars. As Carl Sagan would say, billions and billions of stars all around. <laughs> So we see these galaxies, and they're everywhere. So we see stars like our own with planets, and we now know that most of the planets, or a large fraction, have, most of the stars have planets. So we know there's a huge number of planetary systems out there. And these galaxies come in all different shapes and sizes. Right? And they also, the galaxies themselves, each 100 billion stars, come, come in groups. Small groups, or... Okay, so this is a remarkable picture. This is the Coma Cluster. That's a thousand galaxies that are all gone together. They have been born together long ago. And these big ones in the center are like hundreds of times bigger than the sun. They've eaten a hundred other galaxies for lunch. So when we look out, we see these huge collections of stars. And in fact, if you take an absolutely blank area of the sky, and you take the Hubble Space Telescope, and you point at it for 10 days, the director of the Space Telescope, Science Institute did this several years ago. 
this is what you see, the Hubble Deep Field. Except for that thing there and that thing, everything here is a galaxy. You see thousands of galaxies in the area of a grain of sand held at arm's length. The entire sky is covered with them. And so we can count. There's about 100 billion observable galaxies, each with 100 billion stars. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Now, why did the director do this? Well, because he wanted to look at the little tiny things here. We wanted to look at it, the astronomers, because they don't look like normal galaxies. Now, why not? It's because of the main blessing and curse of astrophysics. When you look out in space, you see back in time. If you look at the sun, you don't see it like it is now. You see it how it was it's eight minutes ago, because it takes light eight minutes to get here. So let me ask you a question. Suppose there's a very advanced civilization on a planetary system 60 million light years away. And they're looking at the Earth right now with enormous telescopes. What are they seeing? No, they're seeing dinosaurs. 60 million years, 60 million years ago, there were dinosaurs walking around on the planet Earth. So that civilization doesn't have to guess whether there were dinosaurs walking on the Earth. They can see them. Okay? When we look out in space, we see back in time. That's the blessing. The curse is, if the civilization wants to know what's happening now on Earth, they can't. They have to wait 60 million years. Right? So, we wanted to look at these galaxies, some of which are 10, that took them like 10 billion years to get here. We're seeing what they were 10 billion years ago. So we can see them being born. We can see baby galaxies. Now, let's suppose I tell you that the universe we know here started in the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. And suppose I can look out at such a large distance that the light took 13.7 billion years to get here. What would I see? I would see the Big Bang. I would see the Big Bang. That picture's been taken. And my friend, uh, uh, George Smoot, won the Nobel Prize for that in, 19, in 2006. That is it. So we don't have to guess whether a Big Bang happened. We can take a picture of it, which has been done. This is a picture of the high pole sky, and uh, these spots are the largest and oldest structures that will ever be seen in light, because that's the edge of the visible universe. So where's the dark matter in all this? Where's the dark energy? Well, it's called dark for a good reason. It doesn't clock. It doesn't shine. And if it doesn't shine, how are you going to see it? So luckily, astronomers can do another thing. Besides taking a picture like this galaxy, they can take a spectra and measure the speed that things are moving. Like a police can measure the speed of your car. They copied astronomers. And that's how they bounce a radio wave off your car and tell you how fast you're going and give you a ticket. Well, we've been doing it for hundreds of years. And uh, you can see that this side of the galaxy is coming toward us at about a half a million miles an hour. And this side's going away. So you can see that this thing's spinning around. We don't guess that, we just measure it and see that it is. Now, fine, what's wrong with that? Well, there is something wrong with that, because we know how much mass is in all those stars, and we have Newton's laws which tell us how fast things go, given how much mass. And a half a million miles an hour is way too fast. This galaxy should be flying apart if it's moving that fast, which it is. So we're stuck with a puzzle. It's not just this galaxy, it's every galaxy you look at has this problem. So what do you do? Well, there's we think of hypotheses and we test them. One hypothesis is that there's some invisible matter here, that there's actually a lot more matter than in the stars. Okay? Another hypothesis is that Newton's laws don't work. Well, Newton's laws are based on Einstein's theory of general relativity, so you have to throw out that. That's a serious hypothesis you have to consider, and then through many uh, experiments and tests, that has been ruled out. So we're stuck, and I'm gonna skip the scientific measurements here, we're stuck with the view that the answer is dark matter. That in fact, every time you see a picture of a galaxy, there's a little blob and there's a big dark matter halo. We know that because when you measure the speeds of things going around here, they're going way too fast. Now this was established 20 years ago. In the last few years, we find more and more evidence. It's absolutely incontrovertible now. And one of the coolest ones is this. This is another one of these clusters of galaxies. Everything is a galaxy. This was Hubble Space Telescope. But see these little archy things? These are little tiny galaxies sitting behind this cluster of galaxies, way in the background. And they've been stretched into arcs. That's predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's called gravitational lensing, which is my speciality, in fact. And what you can do from that is you can measure the mass. 
And the mass you see here is way, five times more than the mass of stars. So we know that this, ga this cluster of galaxies has five times more material in it than you can see. Now, what is this material? We don't know. But we do know something. We know that there's at least five times as much. Many lines of reasoning say it can't be made of ordinary stuff. It can't be made of atoms. It's some mysterious substance unlike anything here on Earth. Yeah? This is what I like to research on, try to figure it out. Maybe it's black holes, maybe it's these particles, we don't know. Okay? So there's the dark matter. Where's the dark energy in all this? The dark energy is even stranger than the dark matter. To understand that, you really have to go into Einstein's theory of general relativity. Einstein wrote down this theory out of aesthetic beauty, and then it worked. And then people tried to shoot it down and failed. And every time it made a prediction, the prediction was right. So we're stuck with it. That's how we do science. We don't, we don't, do, we don't go believe in it because Einstein's great. We are there because we try to kill it and can't. The scientific theories are the ones that remain standing after everything else has been shot down. So where is the dark energy? Well, Einstein's theory says that the universe expands. Now we can test that. We can go back to this one and we can measure the speed, remember, of all those galaxies. And they're all moving away from us, sometimes at a high fraction of the speed of light. And the smaller ones, the farther ones, are moving faster. That is the expansion of the universe. Now, Einstein's theory also says, predicts how the expansion goes. And my friend Saul Perlmutter, a few years back, was, set out to measure that. And what the theory says is the universe should expand, but in the early universe it goes very fast, then it slows down because of all the matter in it kind of has a gravitational attraction and causes the universe expansion to decelerate. So he set out to measure that deceleration, which is an indirect way of getting at the amount of dark matter. And what he found totally surprised him. In fact, it surprised him so much he had to share the Nobel Prize because he did, wasn't bold enough in his first paper. And again, I'll skip the actual signing of the plots that you used, but here it is on the cover of Science Magazine. What he discovered was the universe was not slowing down, it was speeding up. Well, actually, in the beginning, it was slowing down. It started out expanding very fast, slowed down, and now recently, in the last like four or five billion years, it started to speed up. Weird, very weird, and as you can see, the people in science put a puzzled look on Einstein's face there. <laughs> so my friend Saul, who I worked with at Berkeley, he won the Nobel Prize in 2011, and he had to share it with those two guys because he wasn't bold enough in his first paper to say that's what it was. And another group came along and they found exactly the same thing. And they said, well, we think it's the it's a dark energy. We don't know what this is either, just like we know the dark matter. This has even wider possibilities. It could be, and this is the most common uh, idea, the energy of empty space, called the cosmos or constant. Empty space has energy. This comes out of quantum field theory. It's a very reasonable idea. It could be right. It could be new particle physics, okay? Some new kind of extra dimensions or something like this. It could also be that Einstein's theory is wrong. It needs to be changed. That would be the most interesting, that's what, that's what we're all voting for because, you know, showing Einstein is wrong is what we want to do, man. That's how you get famous, man. Einstein got famous by proving Newton was wrong. We gotta prove Einstein's wrong, but so far. So we're left with, with the uh, cosmic pie which is, I think, wondrous and amazing. This is way weirder than those people who were wondering what was up in the space would have thought of. This is how the most of the universe is made of this dark energy, 70%. About 25% of dark matter. Atoms, which are mostly free hydrogen and helium, make up only about 4.5%. Stars and planets are less than one half a percent of what's out there. And then heavy elements, like carbon, oxygen, uranium, gold, everything that we love in this room, that's even a smaller fraction, okay? So is this model correct? Well, I don't have time to go into it, but there's now multiple, multiple lines of reasoning. Everything points that this is correct, okay? We have so many different tests of this, and they all pass. So we humans finally have a standard model of cosmology that's based on science. We know pretty much what's out there. There's a lot we don't know. But we know how much of all this stuff is out there, and we know when the universe started, and we don't know what it's going to do because it depends on what the dark energy is going to do. You have to solve that problem to understand the fate of the universe. Okay? So we can't say what that is yet. So we conclude 
that the Copernican revolution continues. Humans are not only not at the center of the universe, we're not even made of the main stuff of the universe. Atoms are an afterthought in the universe. Dark energy mostly, dark matter, atoms 4%. Okay. We don't know what the dark matter is, but we know that it holds galaxies together. There's a lot of it, five times more than atoms. We don't know what the dark energy is, but we know it's causing the universe to expand ever faster. That's what we mean by dark energy. It may not even be a stuff, it might just be a wrong theory. But it's whatever's causing the accelerated expansion. And because those are puzzles there, we have a lot more work to do, which makes being a scientist so much fun. Thank you very much. Makes my head pop. It's so amazing. The, I mean, just to hear. I mean, those numbers, the things we don't know, the things we could find out. And, I mean, obviously, the, uh, the one thing I learned there, which maybe the one downer, is that uh, you know, astrologer, astro astronomers uh, invented uh, police radars. Uh, but I guess we'll let them go because the rest is. Also, the atom bomb. God, you're really claiming what's that? <laughs> but okay, that's totally awesome. And now we have uh, we have uh, Tally and Steve who are going to perform a song called Stardust. So, guys, please give them an enormous welcome. <laughs> Yeah. 
because this is the start of a community and it's wonderful to think about the big wonderful things that are out there, but one of the reasons we do the Sunday Assembly background music. Uh, the, uh, and one of the reasons is uh, that we do it is because there's so much wonder just in the room that, you know, building community is what this is about. It's lovely to see kids here because we've now got, you know, Sunday school and all that. But one of the tricky things is, in London, we want to build all that stuff here. One of the tricky things is, when you do community, is to try to get people to know each other. And uh, luckily, we have an awesome game which is excellent for people to get to know each other. So do you want to play it? Yeah. All right, so do your feet. Okay.
lemonade somewhere. Just since last Thursday, we have had uh, we've had emails from over I think it's almost 300 people who've said that they would like to start a Sunday assembly of their own. Uh, so far, we've had uh, two people from Alabama, uh, but but no one from Mississippi. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is at the and so we're just trying to find a way that we think that we can help them as quickly as possible. Uh, and so, at the same time as this, there is, uh, we've got uh, a crowdfunding campaign going on. Please feel no pressure to donate. If you like, we've done a funny video, which we're just going to show you. If you like it, please share it with anyone you like on the Facebook or the Twitter or the... Do you guys have that here? <laughs> you got the NSA! You've got the NSA! Alright then, you can... But luckily, and now the whole world's got the NSA too. Uh, it's the gift that keeps on listening. <laughs> uh, and, and so we just got a funny little video, we thought we'd show it to you because it explains a bit where we come from and if you like it, share it and all that. Uh, and so, here is it all. Oh, look, at these guys are good. Alright, simple. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sam. And I'm Pippa. And together we started the Sunday Assembly. It's all the best bits of church, but with no religion and awesome pop songs. It's a celebration of life. And it's not the cult. But that's exactly what we say. To explain this properly, let's begin at the beginning. It was almost three years ago when we were in a car driving to Bath. Would you rather just two comedians going to a gig? I'll stroll just above your bottom. When it turned out, we both wanted to do something like church for people who didn't believe in God, but did believe in good. We started in London in January, and now hundreds meet twice a month to hear great talks, sing awesome songs, help in the community, and share tea and cake. But no Kool-Aid. <laughs> the funny thing was, it accidentally went a little bit viral. More and more of London, they see us to waking up on a Sunday morning and going to church. It turns out there are loads of people out there who want to live better, help often and wonder more. There's already one in Melbourne, New York, Bristol and Brighton. By the end of the year, there'll be 30. That's a 3,000% growth rate. I think. We've got this far, just us and a boatload of volunteers, but we've had hundreds of requests from people who want a Sunday assembly of their own. And if we want to reach the 300 million people across the world who have no religion, we're going to have to get digital. Here comes the science bit. We are raising money to turn our website into a powerful and easy to use digital platform, entirely dedicated to bringing people together in congregations that celebrate life. It will take you from A, wanting a Sunday assembly, to B, meeting other like-minded folk in your area, to C, helping you bring together all the elements you need to start your own, to D, the big day when you launch your assembly. And it will incorporate E features that let you grow your assembly social. One congregation could never afford this website, but if we all chip in together, we can make one site that can be used by the whole world and help thousands of local communities. 
and millions of people. And we want to give this all away for free, which is why we're asking you for money. £500,000, to be precise. Say what? I know, it's a lot of money, and you probably think we're going to be doing this. Oh. You see, to do this brilliantly, we're going to have to hire the best designers, developers and programmers in the world. And they are expensive. If you want to know exactly what we're going to spend it on, please pause now. We need your help to build an organisation that has only works online to helping people live better, help often and wonder more. Throughout recorded history, humans have gathered together to celebrate their values. So imagine what could happen if we married the best parts of religion with modern science. Imagine if we had the tools to help others and to make ourselves as good as we could be. Imagine if we combined inspiration, technology and community to bring human potential to the dizzying new heights. In this one life, we know we have. That's the mission of the Sunday Assembly. It's ambitious, but totally doable. Please support our project. Let us change the world with love and tech. Reason and joy. And tea and cake. <laughs> Some people who've got a little upset about that video thinking there's a part where I'm mocking Jesus uh, because uh, I'm wearing a white sheet. Uh, and I'd just like to reassure everyone that's got, we did, we were just like making a cult joke there. I should be like, that's just my face. <laughs> you know, you know, anything that I could do could be seen to be like, oh, look. <laughs> Jesus in a blazer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and the sharp eyes amongst you will have noticed that even in all our attempts to be bling, those were just five pound notes we scratched together. Uh, and so well, look, without further ado, I would just like to welcome the wonderful Debbie onto the stage, who will announce uh, the, uh, well, it's got various things to announce, so I will pass that on as she does the notices. Debbie! creating the Sunday Assembly, or something like it, here in San Diego. We're going to have a meeting at the park next Saturday at 1 p.m. Every Saturday we have a booth that's on El Prado, by the, in front of the El Prado restaurant, where a group of atheists, humanists, free thinkers, non-believers uh, sit out there and outreach to the public to let other non-believers know who we are and what we're about. So next Saturday, join us there. At 12 noon, there's actually a discussion group that meets. I don't know what the topic is for next Saturday, but it will be listed on our meetup websites. Following that, 
we'll talk about Sunday assembly. So if you're interested in doing it, contact me before then or show up next Saturday at one o'clock. Bring a lawn chair. Yeah, bring a bring a chair and some snacks. Let's just thank Debbie who sorted uh, all of this out. Uh, there's Others and the uh, again, this is uh, she asked us to come over here so we can sh show what we do. And if there's any other people who want to carry this on, we're gonna Neil and others, we're gonna have a little chat after this uh, in that corner over there. So if anyone's interested, just we can talk about it then. And uh, it's gonna be uh, amazing, uh, I think. To well, firstly, this. I don't know if we really hope to get one going, mostly so that I can visit San Diego for more than 12 hours. Uh, and because it definitely seems to be a place that we should uh, come back to. And uh, certainly by the amount of people here, it definitely seems that there's, there would be people who would like to come. Uh, and, yeah, and at this stage, more than things was just coming over and showing how it gets done. Uh, we always like to have a talk which can be informative and entertaining exactly as it was. Uh, and then at the end, just a few words to, uh, you know, to put it together, like on whatever theme it is. And, uh, well, you know, for wonder is, I mean, that's one of our core things, you know, live better, help often, and wonder more. There's, uh, there's so many, there's wonder which is both big, and then there's wonder which is very small. And, you know, we, we're here to hopefully be able to help foster that, you know, help people find it uh, every, every day. You know, this wonder's always lurking in the strangest of places if we know how to look for it. Uh, personally, I always think that the, uh, the easiest way that you can find wonder is to, to just think that we're going to die and then there's nothing. You know, for a lot of people that's depressing, but I can never think of a happier thought. You know, I'm, I'm being serious here. If you ever want to just give yourself a little uh, kick up the backside, and uh, you know, whenever it's getting, just to, to think that one day is going to end. I mean, to think about the nothingness, which is so complete. You know, the nothingness where you will have fewer feelings, thoughts, and emotions than this music stand. <laughs> Depressing, not for me. Not for me at all, because it just reminds me what we have right now. Right now, you know, you can, you can find wonder in the smallest of things. You know, I just went and wrapped my knuckles on there, and right now, that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and you can concentrate on the hurt, or it can tell you that right now that you are alive. You know, and it can be found, if it can be found in the pain of your knuckles, if that moment of transcendence can be found then, how much easier it can be found when listening to Dr. Kim Grice tell us about the wonders which are in the heavens? How much easier can it be found in, you know, a mouthful of delicious cake, which I'm in a weird position to be later on today eating a cake with my own name on it? Uh, something which has never happened before. I'm a comedian, I've often dreamt to have my name up in lights. There's no part of me which ever thought, one day I will have my name in icing. Uh, and, uh, and so for me, I think the easiest way to find that wonder every day is to realise you know, how finite this is. To realise that each breath is one of a limited number we'll have. Uh, I even like to think about my own perfect death. Uh, does anyone here have a perfect death the way they'd like to go? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, okay, we've got you madam, what's your name? Jenny, what's your dream death? There we go, that is, I have something very similar. You know, it's a bit of a cliche, uh, but I dream of dying peacefully in my sleep, uh, but next to someone I dislike. <laughs> There's some people who find that thought depressing, there's some people who find that thought overwhelming, there's some th people who find that thought makes them alone, but for me it makes me ever closer to the reality that I experience every day. And if the Sunday Assembly can in some way, you know, create an organisation that helps, you know, feed that part of us which has got our minds on other things and also helps, you know, 
cope when times are tough and helps us, you know, take the wonders in this community and help those around us, then I think that's a wonderful thing. So afterwards, uh, after we've sung one more song, uh, then after we've had some tea and cake, I will be, you know, there'll be a group of us waiting over there. And if anyone here wants to help build that, if anyone here would like to create that community, if anyone here would like to, you know, build something, a place for families and people of all ages, then I'd like to hear from you, hear from you because looking out in this room, I think we could create something wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what you mean to come here in San Diego? The correct part.